The following was recorded in front of a live studio audience at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. This is the United Podcast Network. Welcome to the Quirky Dog Podcast, inspired by some of the quirkiest dogs you can ever imagine and the owners who love them. This podcast is brought to you by the quirky couple themselves, Scott and Jess Williams. Their aim is to educate and entertain. Here's Scott and Jess. Welcome, guys, and happy Wednesday. We are here for episode 101. I guess we're continuing forward after episode 100. Against my better judgment. (laughs) We've done a lot of things against your better judgment. It works out fine for you. We have a very special guest here today. She is joining us all the way from the Midwest. Her name is Robin McFarland. But first, we're going to start with the quirky tip of the day. (laughs) And that quirky tip is click on the apparel link, you guys. I know I mentioned it last week, but apparel is going to be open through today, if you're hearing about it for the first time, until Halloween. So place those orders, and then orders will start shipping out like mid-November, but we do this whole pre-sale thing. Same company we worked with last time, two logos. Click on the link to check it out. So Robin McFarlane has been a dog trainer for decades. She has helped thousands and thousands of dogs. We always talk about how we have worked with a lot of dogs. Robin has helped way more dogs than either of us or both of us combined. Um, And she has a hell of a business out there in the Midwest. Scott and I actually met at one of her conferences, Epalooza. I was speaking about Canon Entertainment and Scott was speaking about nose work. And you can see how that all ended up for us. So Robin holds a deep place in our heart and she's big into helping the advancement of remote collar training and speaking about it from an educated perspective. So you can find her at my That's My Dog link and the Your Dog's Hero link that we're going to include in show notes. She has an in-person business and she does some of her more individual stuff. But thank you for joining us here today, Robin. We're super excited to have you on. Yeah, good to see you. Good to see you guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Appreciate it. And congrats on your 100th Thanks. Show. Thanks. That's, that's awesome. a lot of commitment. Yeah. Well, I've had to drag her along, <laughs> kicking and screaming. <laughs> <laughs> He's such a pain in the ass. All right, so tell us a little was, bit about she you. She was really quiet when I first met her. Yeah, oh yeah. I had to bring yeah. her out of her <laughs> Rob, Robin uh-huh. knows, Robin knows how shy uh-huh. I was. Uh-huh. So tell us a little bit about what you do and your history, um, more so a little more in depth than what I just described, just so people have a little background on you. Well, um, depends how far we want to go back, uh, <laughs> but I'll give you this in a really quick version. We'll make this the two-minute um version. So I, I wanted to be a veterinarian. That was my deal. That was my jam. I thought that's what I wanted when I was in college, started out pre-vet, found out in the Midwest that meant doing things to dairy cows that I was not keen on at all. So then I was lost and I thought, what the hell am I going to do? So I moved out to the West coast. I started working on a Marine science degree. Um, because I thought, wouldn't that be cool? I want to, I want to work with dolphins. Yeah. Ooh, it sounds lovely. <laughs> And I went broke because I was paying out-of-state tuition. So I took a job in a vet clinic and it was a small animal clinic. So I was working, I was going to school, loved the small animal medicine, um, ended up quitting my master's program. And that was my exposure to behavior. Obviously, like everybody else, all of us grew up with dogs, grew up with horses, you know, loved animals. Um, But that was my exposure to behavior. Ended up working in the veterinary profession for about 10 years as a technician and, uh, And that was where you start hearing the stories of people having problems. And that's what really kind of ignited the interest in how do we train dogs and how can I help people? So it was back in actually 1994 that I started um, training part-time. The vet I was working for said, yeah, go ahead and you can use the building. You can do some things. And I started out with um, a puppy preschool program. You know, we wanted to start young and, and do some positive influence. And interestingly, for anybody that's followed my career at all, Jess, I started out very all positive. I did, um, I mean, I was a huge advocate and still, you know, really pay a lot of attention to, I started out doing a lot of Ian Benbar's work mm-hmm. and I studied all of his tapes and that was kind of the premise for the puppy classes. And then as dogs got older, I was like, "Mm, you might need a little bit of balance here in some of the training. Some of these dogs were a little bit of a handful. And uh, so as time went on, I just liked the behavior part of it more than the medical part. And then had a change of life experience when I was in an accident, broke my legs, broke one of my vertebrae, blah, 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 all that nonsense that when you start, you know, communicating with the big guy upstairs saying, okay, I'm going to really going to pursue my passion now. Uh, So I quit my job, started training full time, 
uh, went to a couple different dog training schools and, and that is, um, ultimately what led me to what I've got today. Now a training facility out here in the Midwest, um, and along the process uh, of my growth, like any other trainer, you, you keep hitting some situations in some cases where you're like, I need to learn more. Yep. And uh, somewhere in the late 90s, my needing to learn more led me to starting to learn about remote collars. Mm -hmm. And as I learned about remote collars, and as I took them into the pet industry, I realized what a game changer it could be for a lot of my clients. Um, and, and, and that's when I became more and more passionate about it because they were so maligned uh, within the industry. And what I could see is this is helping my average pet owner just have a better life with his dog. You know, if nothing else, at least they can go out and they can enjoy the hiking trails and yeah. they can do it safely. And the more I got into it, the more outspoken I got because I just felt like so many of my pet owners were getting trashed for making this choice. Mm -hmm. And um, I've been known to uh, have opinions and not, I'm, I'm not hesitant to express them. And I guess, you know, if I, if I, developed a reputation as being outspoken for that. I'm okay with that because it really was always just to advocate for my pet owners being able to enjoy their dogs a little bit more. And this was a tool that helped get them there. Yeah, no, we're That's all about sure. strong women in the dog world, especially when they're preaching the right message. So tell us a little bit too about the education that you've done for other people, because like outside of the personal dogs that you've worked with and your employees have worked with, you have put a lot of education out there to help teach other people how to properly use these tools and everything as well in dog training, correct? I, I have. Um, education uh, is my passion, talking about it and teaching it. And so uh, I've done a tremendous amount of writing. I, I lost count. I, I think I've written a couple hundred blogs. Um, I've written a few articles. Um, for periodicals within our industry. I did get asked a number of years ago, I wrote for Police Canine Magazine. Um, I have trained a couple hundred seminars over the course of, of my career. Probably the highlights, if I, if I can touch on the highlights, um, I got invited by some of the handlers from the canine, uh, Police Pentagon Canine Team, worked with them, helping them. Um, I was at Quantico a number of years ago, worked with the guys out there, um, quite a few police departments, um, uh, state of Wisconsin police, uh, uh, patrol had me up to put their unit, their whole unit on remote collars. Um, I went to Athens, Greece in 2008, wow. which was amazing. super cool yeah. yeah, because there was only, I think three audience member that's, that spoke English. So, and that was cool because when we had a language barrier and we had to have a translator, it made a, a lot of sense to the people in the audience when they recognized that the e-collar could be used with a, as a new language for the dogs. And it just made a lot of sense. And they really grasped the concepts very quickly because they understood language barriers. Um, so that was cool. Those were some highlights. I have um, trained, I don't know, about 300 dog trainers, I think, around yeah. the country. Um, doing seminars and workshops and them coming out here to mentor with me. And uh, probably the most recent things that I've been doing, I work quite a bit with my friends at Gundog Supply, and they've had me create a series of videos um, that are geared toward pet owners, uh, trying to teach them, you know, how to how to apply this tool correctly and in a fair and humane way with their dogs and get uh, get good results. So yeah, a lot of stuff. Yeah, she yeah. she makes us look like couch potatoes. No, I the first time we met, I went to one of your seminars. I'm sure that's where we met the first time in Southern California. I'm not sure if you were with Behesha Grist at that time, doing a duel, or I know JT was out there. Maybe JT brought you in, but oh, probably. Uh, yeah, yeah I, probably. it was in San Diego, down in that area, and I was yep. I was trying to soak up as much as I could on these e collars because the first time I put an e collar on my dog, because everyone said how great they were. You know, and how, and how I told my dog to sit and tap the button. He yelped. I took the collar right off and said, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. <laughs> I need to go get some, I need to get some training. And I started going to seminars and uh, you were one of the first seminars I went to. I, I remember yep. going to see you and then Behesha and uh, Fred Hassan. And yep. then, and I think probably I saw you more than once in a seminar setting. There were different times that you had come out, but it was very valuable. And, and the thing is, you, I learned from those seminars a lot for myself, but I was also looking at all the dogs. 
And it seemed like in those particular seminars I went to, there was always about between 18 and 23 or four dogs. It just seemed to be right around 20 dogs. And out of the 20, like 18 of them were dramatically improved. I mean, mm -hmm. just about off leash. And we're talking just a Saturday, Sunday, a two day deal. And there, was, there seemed to be always one that was just especially difficult in those settings. But those numbers, I mean, you just couldn't argue with the, with the results there. And these were people that had no training. They were pet dog owners. They knew nothing. Yeah. They were just following yeah. direction, and it was made very simple. And, um, the, and the thing is, the dogs that were difficult in that setting um, were difficult in all set settings. There were some very yeah. difficult dogs. I mean, you guys didn't turn any dog away. There were dogs there with human aggression. There was all kinds of stuff going on. And, and I saw... You know, put a muzzle on this dog because he's, he's trying to bite people and just working them through it and getting them to the other side of it. And it was pretty impressive, you know. So that kind of sold me on the use of the collars. And I started to incorporate them right away into everything I was doing. And, and, uh, and how I long never, ago I, was that? That was, I don't know, 2000. Two, three, something in there. Yeah, so you guys, I mean, you guys have some pretty hefty history here with the use of this tool. I mean, both of you were talking at least 20 years knowing this tool and seeing this tool and then also seeing it evolve because you mentioned gun dog supply and, you know, they're definitely one of the more modern makers of a remote collar at this point in time. Or a distributor. Well, yeah, yes. but, and they use, and like, you know, we use dog trail with our clients because it's just easy. Now. Yeah. There, a lot of things have changed, but we just like the ease of the technology with, you know, there's not as many settings as like an e-collar technology is remote, but it's just, it's changed so, so much over those two decades. And a lot of people don't necessarily realize that I feel like. Yeah. yeah. I know that yeah. the, um, not to talk over you, but the, um, the good collar, which the one that was made in Arizona, which we got, they got bought out by, who was Tritronics. Who was it? Tritronics. Tritronics so got the, bought out by yeah, Garmin. Right. Yeah. So the best collar, like the high end collar, it was like a rolling pin. The <laughs> transmitter was so friggin' big that like you couldn't hide it. You know, it was like back in the day. <laughs> and now, you know, all that technology has evolved so much that everything is very. Now they have the finger kick. They have these little tiny things yeah. to, to it. So it's a big difference now. You know, and not yeah, to mention, and like everything. Well, actually. Uh, I don't know. Can you guys see this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's the rolling the, pin. My, the antenna. Yeah. Well, this is this is even prior to really? our time, Scott. Right. This is prior to our time. That is this real. That is a real ancient. roller rolling pin. This yeah. is yeah, and this had a three foot antenna, thirty six right. inch antenna. My antenna broke off. This is the what they called the gold tube. This is probably, from my understanding, circa nineteen eighty. Yeah. Um, which was an advancement from when these things began. My well, understanding is late fifties, early sixties. So this phones. was actually an advancement. Here's the here's the collar. Talk about being able to teach a dog. Oh to my stay gosh! Right, strap this thing on. That's not going to fit very well on a twenty five and under. <laughs> yeah. The neck will be hitting yeah. the ground from the weight. And the and the yeah. collars had antennas coming off of them also. They'd have yes. the antenna coming up off the side of the dog's head. And every year, yeah. I feel like you work more closely with these companies and these distributors and manufacturers than we do. But every year, I feel like they're trying to like just be on the top of their game with technology, like always refining. Is that the case from what you see on your end? Yeah, I would. Uh, yes, definitely every year. Uh, probably every two years, a new prototype comes across my desk from somebody um, says, you know, we're working on this. We're changing thought process here. What are your thoughts? Um, or what do you want to see? Where should we be going with this? Um, it, it's like any other technology, the things continue to advance. Um, and with advancement, obviously that that's what changes the techniques also, because yeah. as we gained more finesse, then the techniques start to adapt and change along the way. Unfortunately, even though the techniques have changed so much based on the technology, there's still too many people out there that think shock collar and they still think about way back in the 60s when basically this was one or two buttons and it was nothing more than stopping power. Yeah. And we've had a really hard time getting people to, to make this leap in understanding that it's not a shock collar. It was, mm -hmm. I'm not going to deny that it was 1960s, 1970s, one button, and it was only used for stopping power. We're in 2021. We're moving into 2022. It, it, it is so much different. It's tactile communication. Um, there's an incredibly different way to use it than than what it was way back then. But 
We're that, still having to work hard to change people's thought process about that. That, that kind of segues my thinking into the, the legal and political aspects of the uh, remote callers. And for me, I have zero concern that these tools are going to be outlawed in this country. I know you have been an advocate for making sure that type of thing never happens. But I just feel like, and I could be living, you know, under a rock, but I feel he like often there's, does. there's so just much, as a side note, if we're going to be honest, <laughs> there's so much benefit to these, to these tools, uh, that I just can't imagine all of a sudden the sweeping legislation is going to outlaw them, you know, but I know that there are, there are organizations that just work at that, just sit there chipping away, trying to get communities and states to try and ban, just like uh, breed specific legislation, I guess would be a, a similar type of thing. You know, if you don't realize it happened all of a sudden, boom, it happened, you know? And that's, yeah, that, you know, that's the scary thing, honestly, Scott, that I've been busy the last couple of weeks helping a colleague. Um, there is a clause uh, currently being reviewed in Congress to not allow the use of remote callers in a particular, um, a particular area. And I think that's the way they'll attempt to chip away from uh, away, you know, one little niche at a time. Mm -hmm. Um and so we're doing the best we can to watch out for that. And it's, it, it's it, not only is it misguided, it's generally when you follow the money trail, yes. it's, it's about controlling where the revenue goes. Yep. And if you can limit people's uses of tools, you can you know, put all the revenue stream to yourself because you're not. And that's usually the source of who's writing or Which, trying to get these pieces of legislation. And that tends to go, place. that goes to the pharmaceuticals. Because that's the only way to control the dog without any training is to just drug them to the point of not doing anything, you know? Uh, such a, yeah, well, we, there's a big rabbit hole we can go down. Yeah. Such a shame, right? <laughs> I, I mean, come on. I got five and six month old puppies coming in that vets want to put on Prozac and yeah. shit like that. I mean, I'm... Don't get me started. I'm going to start saying four-letter words and all no, kinds but of shit. We see the same these thing. People are, no, it, these it, morons. It, it's so it frustrates me ridiculous. too. And the only reason that it bothers us is because when you see the pharmaceutical trend that we saw in humans, where okay, money, 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 grab, 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 take this drug to counteract this problem after you took this drug. But then also, I just see the dog suffering, and that's what I have a hard time with. And similarly to like, you know, the people that are purely positive and you guys know, I don't train my dogs with pinch collars, knee collars. I personally choose to go more of the positive route as far as my own dog training. Scott and I train balance with our pet dogs. I think for sure it's the best way to go and provides the best results, but you have all of this stuff going on at once, right? And like all of these people talking and the purely positive people say, oh, well, nobody comes and wants to learn about what we're doing. And my counter argument is like, well, are you guys learning like the new e-collar technology stuff? You don't have to do anything with it. You don't have to pick them up, but are you poking your heads around and researching these types of things? And if I talk about medication and I say, well, we happened to train 150 dogs last year, really problematic dogs, none of them are on medication. No one's asking, well, what techniques did you use? It's just like I'm, you know, being, being down on meds, which it's not necessarily that. It's just if that's the first go-to, there's still a lot of fallout because how many people then reach us and they've been using meds for two years, they upped the dose, they did this, and they still need help, you know? So there's just a lot going on in the industry. And I just think the way that things are evolving and changing, we need to be aware of and people need to educate themselves about because times change, training changes. It does. It does. And it doesn't help that there's so much, um, there's so much conflict within the industry. And, and, and as you said, you know, studying from one another, whether or not it's a tool or a technique uh, that you ever want to employ in your own practice is irrelevant. You should at least have knowledge of it yes. and how to use it. And rather than simply outright bashing something that that's deeply frustrating to me, which, you know, the, the conference that, that uh, Scott mentioned, you guys mentioned where you met, I used to hold that uh, a conference years ago. And the whole point of it was to bring opposing viewpoints together and say, you know what, bottom line, let's remember we're all in this because we're trying to help the dog in front of us. And we're trying to help the clients keep their dogs. And the more knowledge we have, whether or not you want to reproduce this tool, this technique, at least if you understand it and you don't do it yourself, you can refer out to somebody that can, because our, our responsibility needs to be the dog in front of us rather than an ideology that we want to, um, you know, we want to pin. It seems like the loudest voices on the opposing, um, you know, all positive side never have a dog in front of them. 
It's all based in science and writing. It's just writing a lot of articles that are really, it's, and the thing is, you know, people, nobody wants to think of their dog in an unpleasant situation, being stressed, all that other stuff. But the reality is, I mean, our kids and, and you know, me in included, if I'm learning something new, there's a certain amount of stress there. And if I have to cram for a test and take a test, I'm gonna have some anxiety and some stress. And when I get past it, I feel better. And the next test I have to take, I feel more confident. Well, I passed the last one, I'm sure I can pass this one. And I always use that analogy with, with my clients and their dogs because I prefer to always be putting some stress on, taking it off, so that they, the dog is becoming more resilient. They're more tempered. Yeah, and they're, and they're more confident, and they're able to get into newer situations without as much anxiety. Uh, rather than protecting the dog, you know, like it's a teacup, it's a piece of porcelain, and it's just going to, you know, and it'll break, you know, easier because it's never had any pressure, you know, and they get super anxious, I think. Well, and it's insulting, in a sense, to these dogs that are just getting pushed around towns and strollers. I mean, I, like, at, at some point, like, when did we don't make switch, me, don't you know? Don't make me give up the stroller. <laughs> you can keep the stroller for Jimmy, but everybody else needs to give up their strollers <laughs> listening and watching. No, but really, like, you know, it, they're, they're dogs. Like, they're, they've been bred to be man's best friend, working dogs. Even little dogs are, the hardest dog in our house is our three-pound freaking Pomeranian. Like, she's got a lot of push and chutzpah to her, you know, and... We're just taking, like, we're changing what we want them to be in our lives. And it's hard for us to see, at least, because it's changed a lot, I'd say, the past 10 years. But the past five years, I just feel like it's just rapidly turning into something that we, neither of us can understand. Yeah, well. I, I agree with you both, yeah. yeah. But, and to your point, um, to your point, Scott, about the stress, I agree with you 100%. I think stress is, is part of it. Uh, I try to tell my clients, look, I'm not going to promise you for a second that I'm not going to put your dog under some stress. I will promise you I will not put your dog into distress. And mm -hmm. there's a big difference yeah. because teaching them how to handle stress and teaching them that, you know, how to, how to deal with it and how, what they can do to problem solve it is what makes them more resilient. That's what gives you the dog that now you can take to the outdoor cafe, or you could take them to the pub with you and you can take them with you hiking where previously you had to drug them and leave them behind, or you had to get yeah. a pet sitter because he couldn't handle anything. Yeah. And, and yeah, the stroller thing. I mean, you're both, we're, we're, we're on the exactly same page. Uh, it, it is such a disservice. Now, if the dog is elderly, obviously I got no problem with, you see that occasional dog. I had my dog, Tommy in a cart temporarily in his final weeks to get him out uh, and, and, and give him a little bit of exposure. Um, but to take that away from a dog, the ability to, to go to ground and to be a dog and to, to sniff and explore the environment, just because you don't think you can control them and you'd rather zip them in a stroller. Don't take those shortcuts and yeah. don't, um, don't limit your dog's world like that. I think that's shameful. Unfortunately, people are beginning to think that's the norm. And that's yeah. why conversations that we're having are so important. It's just, you're being sold short on yeah. what the dog's potential is. Well, that's the thing. Everything, the world gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And actually I haven't said this story and I'm not trying to be inflammatory about it, but my dog was attacked by a behaviorist dog in college. I, I was in the route of psychology and, you know, whatever. So that happened and he got reactive and, and his world got smaller. You know what I mean? And I'm walking him around with the gentle leader and I'm doing all of this stuff. Well, the more I sheltered him, the worse that was. And he was on the finals for CBS's Greatest American Dog. Like he was in LA, they flew us out like to do stuff. He was at dog parks. The dog came to me social. It was this experience that really like set him on a path of fear and the best offense is a good defense and all of this stuff. And, you know, Scott helped work, me work through that. Like, let's get him out in the world. Like, let's reintroduce him and build his confidence. And we were able to take him to the park and play ball again and me not be like, oh my God, what if a dog shows up and I'm so scared? You know what I mean? Because it totally changed the way he was able to live. Like, I didn't want to hike anymore because I didn't want him to mm -hmm. rush a dog because he was too afraid. And that's what we start to do is like, well, the dog isn't capable of doing this, so we're not going to hike. He's not capable of walking when other dogs are out. So walk at night, walk in the dark, walk when times are, you know, quieter. And then what kind of life are we providing? You know what I mean? Like we get dogs to live life with them. And once we take all of that away, then like, I guess it's supposedly more humane, but then the dog's life was just sitting in a house. You know what I mean? Looking at four <laughs> walls. It kind of gets sad as far as if you ask me. You know, I agree with you. I will say uh, with regard to the public that I think that the, the carts or the strollers with dogs, that's an extreme. And I think that the, the majority of the dog owners out there 
they're trying to get some good information. Yeah. They're trying to get their dog trained. And they're getting all of this stuff that doesn't work. And a lot of them are pursuing it for weeks and months. And then when I yeah. see them and say, listen, you know, I, I appreciate what you've been doing. And now let me show you another way we can do this and make it happen. And they're so relieved. They're like, holy shit. I spent so much time trying to get this dog to walk down the street and stopping every time he pulled. And, you know, mm -hmm. doing this and it, nothing was working. And they really put it, a lot of people put in a lot of effort uh, with a methodology that just doesn't, isn't working for them. And it's not that they're totally against uh, a more balanced approach. They're just not, haven't seen it. Yeah. And they're told, yeah. and what they read on the internet is that it's bad. Don't ever do that. This is the only way to do it. And if you try that other stuff, you're going to ruin you're your dog. You're an idiot. You're going to destroy yeah. your dog. And a lot of the yep. vets are touting that same yeah, message. Yeah, now the vets where are pushing all the positives. They're really <sighs> giving people a run for their money and kind of a guilt trip. And yeah, I, I don't, mean. we don't want to like professionally be at odds with vets in any way, shape or form. But like, I'd like to be able to talk to a behaviorist in the area nearby and like collaborate with stuff. We've had clients that have come and said, the behaviorist has told them, yeah, if your dog barks in the crate, leave the e-collar on in the crate. Like, th like put a bark collar on him in the crate. Like, I think some of them are getting to the end of their options too. Like, we're all kind of like, we need to help these dogs and how can we best serve them? And it's not that any, every dog needs to wear an e-collar to have a nice life, but if you're not even including that in your toolbox, it's just a disservice. The same way as if you use e-collars, it's a disservice not to put a clicker in your toolbox. If it's gonna help, Yes. The whole picture, then let's load the toolbox up with everything we have so we can reach for it when we need it. Yeah, I've yep. been lucky enough to have a good clicker trainer in my <laughs> camp. And so she clicked for my dog when I, because I, my timing isn't great with the clicker when I'm actually working with the dog and stuff's going on. Yeah. So she would be watching me. I got my e collar remote in one hand and my clicker in the other hand. That's yeah. how we did ring. I mean, and, uh, <laughs> Well, we're good, though. Dog had, yeah, we dog, were, dog had good scores. We were able to enhance my sport dog's uh, ability quite a bit with being able to mark things with a clicker. But mm -hmm. it wasn't, you know, because I had the ability to do it. It was because she was on the side watching and clicking for the dog, you know, which was really nice. But it's hard to put a team together like that, you know? Mm -hmm. And all of these tools are, are just, they're just information, right? It's yes. information. The more we can give the dog information, the sooner we can get them doing the things we want. We're giving them information. Yeah, you're preaching to the choir. It gets frustrating for me. But um, we, that's why we just take deep breaths and we I stay bet. off social media as much as possible. Well, let me ask you this. Getting back to the technology with the e-collars and getting away from the, uh, the methodology, uh, do, you see, do you have any inside info on where these uh, tools are going as far as enhancements? Because like the finger kick was a pretty big uh, breakthrough a few years ago where you don't have to have a remote in your hand. I've had trouble right. introducing the finger kick to clients because quite often you need to be up and down with that power and you can't do that with the finger click. So then mm -hmm. they'd like set their collar at a certain level and be just using the finger click. But if a distraction pops up, that finger kick isn't enough. They need to be offsetting distractions. So it, to, it, it seems like an enhancement, but I found it to be limiting when it comes to pet dog stuff. You know, it's nice yeah, to have nothing in your we hands. We only use the, the only time we'll do a finger kick for anybody is they're they're basically done with their program i want to teach i teach my clients look when we're when we're in this learning phase when we're early on in generalizing behavior i want you to have the remote in your hand i want you to be able to turn up and down without looking at the remote i want you to watch the dog um, but oftentimes when people will say uh, I have uh, a person that's an avid uh, bicyclist. They do the, what is it when you're out on the trails, the mountain biking. Yeah. yeah. She's crazy about it. And she has a lovely, lovely cattle dog that goes along with her. So the dog was well-trained. He's already been through the program. It's a year down the road. He totally gets it. He's pretty much totally in, you know, you get your working level. Your dog has got right. a good relationship with the handler at that point. Now we can put a finger kick on our bike and it works perfectly fine if he ranges too far to bring him back. And so in situations like that, I've found it helpful, right. but I agree with you hundred percent, Scott, I think for the uh, pet owner that's really just starting with remote collars, I, I, I tend to avoid it until we get the dog capable and we most certainly have the handler pretty capable and understanding what they're doing. That's a major um, feat. Just that by itself is a huge accomplishment. What's that? Getting Making the, ha them? Getting oh, the yeah. handler to know what they're doing and getting comfortable with the tools and, and the leash and reading the dog and all of the pieces that go along with it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, a it, it's a process. As far as where the technology is going, um, 
even as many companies as I've worked with, I'm not privy to uh, anything generally until it launches. And if I am, if they give me a prototype or something, then I'm uh, have a non disclosure. So I really <laughs> she's can't not supposed say. to announce it on a podcast. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah no. Hey, this is what's by the fun. way. <laughs> Hey. What about, um, I want to talk e-collars or remote collars, whatever we want to call them, versus invisible fences. Because I think a lot of people are very concerned that that stimulation is the same. And furthermore, they how love, funny love, is it yeah. to see how many people put an invisible fence in and you say, oh, like, let's use this tool. And oh, I never do that. But they have no problem lighting their dog up if it's going to leave the property. So can you explain to us a little bit about your situation, uh, where you stand on all of that and what you think about it? Um, yeah. Not a, I'm not a huge fan of, of invisible fencing. And here's why. Not because of the product itself, because people use it as a crutch for doing less with their dog. Yeah. yeah. And let me repeat that for anybody listening. Here's why I'm not a big fan, because people use it as a crutch for doing less with their dog. Yeah. They don't have to walk um, it. They just let it out the back door or whatever. They just let it out the back door and they figure, hey, he's got a big yard. He can go entertain himself. Yeah. Well, we all know that, that the dog is just going to probably go on guard duty and things like that. Or well, that's the thing. The barrier whatever. aggression is almost increased because they're just it doing is. that fence line and they're just like, this is my territory. And then the stimulation, yeah. it's different. Like your clients that have used invisible fences and then use the remote, it's different. Dramatically different. Yeah. Um, it's dramatically different. I would say as a general rule, uh, the, the levels on a remote collar, when you get to the upper levels, the upper reaches of that collar simulation is comparable to invisible fencing. Yes. It's because uh, because it, the philosophy is different, right? When we're teaching invisible fencing, the idea is you you get an audible tone as you near those those flags, and the audible tone is your warning to come back into the yard. And if you continue to progress and go across the line, the invisible line, then it is a thou shalt not go there. It's going to be extremely uncomfortable. So it's a strong aversive to teach the dog to stay within a boundary. That's not what remote collars are being used for. We're using remote collars to use this tactile hot game of hot and cold, pressure on, pressure off. Um, so we're using much different levels. Um, obviously, we have to set the level that is valuable to the dog in question. And every dog is different. Their sensitivity is different, which is why these things are adjustable. Um, but if we were using it simply as a high aversive like that, you wouldn't see dogs running around. I mean, when I'm pushing buttons on a remote collar, my dog is running around wagging his tail. Yeah. What do I do next? What's the game next? It's yeah. simply a communication game that I'm playing with him because the levels are so dramatically different. Um, and I think that's really important to understand. Why is it that people have different emotional opinions of the technology? For some reason, I think they let themselves off the hook and they think, well, with invisible fencing, the dog did it to himself. Yeah, yeah potentially. We always hear that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Such nonsense, yeah. such nonsense. I don't want, personally, I don't want my dog to experience that. No. I yeah. don't want my dog to experience that. I want to be out in the yard with my dog. I don't want to set him up to fail. I go out and I play with my dog. I do things with my dog. He's working on his remote collar or we're off hiking or whatever. Um, I don't have to use levels like that for, I can't honestly think of anything that I've had to with my personal dog. I'm not saying never mm -hmm. when yeah. I use an aversive level. I'm yeah. not saying that. But I honestly think if I look back over the span of my career, the rare occasions, I, I did have a farm dog that was really going after and biting the tires. He got rolled twice yeah. uh, with a tractor. And we used a high aversive level with him. So there's been a, a rare occasion where we've done that. But yet, if we see that over and over in a community with dogs on the fence line, people don't seem to have a problem with that. Yeah. I don't understand the dis the disparity in thinking. Um, well, and your dog can you get know, attacked in your yard also, because if your dog's sitting there and going crazy and someone that's walking by with a dog on leash doesn't have a secure setup or they're caught off guard, that dog can now just run into your dog's yard and attack them in their very own space. And that's disconcerting in and of itself. <laughs> like, that's an issue. It's, it's hugely disconcerting and also it's disconcerting if you're the passerby, you yeah. don't know that the fence there, yeah. uh, you know, that's terrifying for a lot of people that are nervous about dogs in general, or I've seen this many times where people have multiple dogs and they're on invisible fence system. And now you walk by and those dogs are territorial. They come charging the fence line and what they do is one redirects on the other and yes. now they're in a fight yes. in their own yard. Yes. Yeah. It, yes. And that's just horrible. Yeah. And again, is it, 
Is that the fault of the product? No, it's not. But it is the fault that the, 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 the owner is not taking responsibility to be out there supervising their dog. And I don't know, I, I hate to put, I, I don't want to point fingers necessarily at a company, but if there are companies out there listening that are installing invisible fence, you need to talk to owners about stepping it up. If they're going to install yeah. this, this is a backup. Yeah. This right. is a backup so that your dog doesn't break out of the yard when you're out there engaged with your dog. But please don't let the dog out into that space unsupervised because all kinds of problem behaviors are likely to pop up. Yeah, 100%. No, we agree with you 100%. Do you yeah. have anything else for Robin? Any other questions? No. While well, we're doing old home week the, here? Well, the invisible fence is a pet peeve of mine also. I, I don't use them. I wouldn't trust one to have my dog in a backyard. And also, I, like you said, I don't want another dog coming into my yard. But when, I, when people, I talk to them about it, why'd you do the invisible fence? I mean, I would uh, definitely just put up a, a solid, you know, physical fence if you want to fence your property. And they'll say, well, I don't want to, it'll take away from my view. Oh, that's too expensive. So it's, oh, they're okay in justifying the invisible fence. It's the aesthetics of the property often. Because the aesthetics, often, you know, yeah. but then when it yeah. comes to the remote collar, they have that big you know, pause. I don't want to be using that tool, you know, but yeah. well, and, and there are a lot of homeowners associations that won't allow right. yeah. fencing. And, and, uh, that's another place, um, in my next phase of my career, it is something that I'm hoping to start to address. I'm starting a nonprofit on, uh, uh it's called aware pet owner and, and I'm helping people recognize more responsible dog behavior. And I would like to work with developers to understand we need to get rid of these, um, associations that don't want to allow fences. Good fences make good neighbors. It keeps everybody safer. Yeah. Uh, there can be aesthetic ways to do it and how they can make developments that are geared toward property owners that want to have dogs and things that can be included in that whole development that would enhance livability for the humans and the dogs there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have, I mean, just with regard to fencing, you know, we're on a big property and um, we just put a very inexpensive rolled wire potty yard right outside the backyard. So in the morning, dogs just run out and they're enclosed. They can go pee, poop, and then come in. And then when we go out into the yard, which nothing is fenced, we're out there with them. So we're throwing the yep. ball. They're hanging out with us. It's, it's, no, it's not a problem at all. And yeah. I, I've explained that to so many of my clients. And I've yet to see someone stake out a potty yard and roll, put up some wire. I mean, like the whole thing's a hundred bucks, you know, it's not a big deal. And yet people just don't do it, you know? Yeah. It's There's a lot like of options out there for people. And I think the most important thing for people to know, especially if you're new to Robin and her training and everything else, and you've been listening to us before, is all three of us love dogs just as much, if not more than most dog professionals out there. Just because we're holding a remote in our hands when we're training these pet dog clients, half the time we're using levels that the owner hasn't even felt when we go to test them. Like it's so often we're doing a return and the owner maybe feels something on 20 or 40 if we're using a dog for collar and their dog's working on, you know, 10. You know, it's just, yeah. it's such a different experience. And I think a lot of times trainers that use these tools get thrown under the bus, but we're out there working. Like we're not sitting on Facebook commenting, having these fights. Like we're <laughs> out there in the field working with owners, with dogs. We're trying to help. And beyond that, I'm not trying to boost our egos, but we're getting rave reviews. Like we're really helping yes. people have a better better life with their dogs, the dogs integrating better with the children and the new dogs and the neighbors and all of these things. And like, that's all at least Scott and I are trying to do is just help dogs and help people be able to help their dogs because there's just a lack of like education out there that seems practical and that gets people somewhere it seems at this point. Yeah, yeah no, I agree with you, Jess. And, uh, I don't know if we have a lot of time, but, uh, you know, you talk about people being on social media and, and the bad mouthing and all the negativity that goes on in regards to tools. When I click on somebody's video and they're trying to tell me how bad a remote collar is and they're doing the theoretical training with a stuffed animal. Yeah. <laughs> it's upsetting. And it's it upsetting. Goes, nothing to talk and it, about. And it goes we perfectly. nothing to talk about. Yeah. It's yeah. upsetting. No, I know. And I have, you know, we could go on all day, but Quite often people will say, well, how long do I need to use the remote collar? Do, you know, when we get done with the training, do I still have to use it? And I tell them it's, I have say, people say that about food too. Yeah. How long do I have to use the food? Training. When is, will it get easier? <laughs> training is for the life of the dog. You know, and uh, if you stop training, it's going to start backsliding. And it's just the same as with your kids. It's like, if you don't keep them on course, 
they'll probably stop going to school around fifth grade because they don't feel like getting up. I'm not going to do it anymore, and they're not going to go, you know? Yeah, no, and yeah. life is hard. Life, it's stressful even now. I mean, we're adults. We have careers. Like, life is hard, and this is, and it's a constant thing with dogs, and I think people get in this mindset of like, oh, I had a dog when I was young. It was super fun. Well, there's a lot of work that goes into having a dog and then making life with it super fun. You know what I mean? It's a commitment, and your stuffed animal analogy is good because, Scott says frequently, like, if you want a dog, maybe you should just get a stuffed animal with a heartbeat first, see yeah. how that goes, like, make sure someone's feeding it, like, yeah. taking it out to potty, because it's, it's a lot, yeah. like, you know, it's... Get up, get up at five in the morning yeah. and take that stuffed animal out in the yard, stand there for an hour, come back yeah. in, go back to bed. If it's zero degrees, same thing, you're out there for a half hour, you yeah. know, and to each yeah. his own, but... I, at least us, and I thank you too, like it's not even so much about reaching across the aisle. It's just about being a kind human being and wanting to help our clients. And and for me at least, and I don't know where you guys stand, it's about helping the dogs. I just see so many dogs suffering and just out of their freaking minds being in their own skin. And it breaks my heart because it doesn't have to be that way for them. Just like people, like you can find tools and mindfulness and you can reel yourself in a little bit versus being in this frenzy for 12 to 15 years. Because chronic stress is bad on humans. It's got to be bad on dogs, you know, and a lot of these dogs are stressed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I agree with you and um, I don't have anything else to add to that. Yeah. Robin, you're kick-ass. Do you have anything else to say? <laughs> Did we touch on everything? Nope. We touched on everything for today. Yeah. I'm sure we could go on for hours, <laughs> but, well. you know. <laughs> we'll have you back on with the nonprofit and we'll talk well, about that in a year or so. You've done a great okay. job, Robin, with the e collars and the training and educating not only the clients, but so many dog trainers. And you've made a mark here in the past yeah. 20 years, you know? Yeah. Whether, yeah. Whether you feel like you're doing or not, I know sometimes you get frustrated. I remember when the pandemic hit, you were pretty upset and all that, but you've, we've all rebounded. We're all back on track, I think. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You're a yeah. front runner out there in the dog world. We appreciate you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I try to stay, I try not to watch. I just keep my nose down, do my work. That's I really what I try yeah, not yeah. to watch. So I was, I, I, appreciate I was, that. I was really pleased that I had no idea that Facebook went down. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I see in the news, I'm like, whoa, Facebook went down. <laughs> Scott doesn't have any social media accounts and we only use it for business mostly. Like it's yeah. good to tune in sometimes, but like put in the work, deliver, show the results, like it, it, be your best self for you and your clients and your community. And that will transcend to a greater world, a broader perspective. But I being 100%. a keyboard warrior yeah. isn't going to help the matter at all. It just... A lot of people have a lot of time, I guess. All right. <laughs> All, right. All right. Thank you so yeah. much for your time. Right. We will see you guys next Wednesday. Go train some dogs, Rob. Right. Yeah. Click on those right. links, guys. We have both links in the description. And meantime, keep it quirky. Thanks, Robin. Thanks. Thank you. The views and opinions expressed by the host, guests, or callers of this program do not Cafe, the United Podcast Network, its partners or affiliates.